Hello everybody, this is The Centralized Dave and Curtis uh, back with yet another podcast. Hi Curtis. Hi David, how's it going? Well, pretty good myself and we haven't done this for uh, quite some time, I think like six months and I've realized that it's actually against my interests to overanalyze stuff. If you watch the podcast from one year ago, you're going to discover that we've made some calls that are now coming true. So there is quite a lack and that's how it is with the calls. You make the call and you just give it a time. You you just, you don't try to overcomplicate it, overanalyze it and change it back and forth three times. It's actually the worst thing you can do. So um, I have honestly realized that perhaps it's even better if we do a podcast like this every once in a long while. Although Curtis has been working on his own channel, so that's going to be included in a in a description, of course. I'm on Twitter every day. I share a few things, and then I'm doing some some videos. But yeah, I agree. Um, you, you know, if you're doing them every week or every day, you're not really making much of an impact because things don't change that fast. It would be actually different if we have a good guest here, then we're going to do the podcast again. For instance, I invited Mark Demesel. If he would mm -hmm. come, then I would do the podcast again, even, the, right. even in October again. Curtis, let's follow our own pattern. So let's start with a Bitcoin analysis. Okay, maybe you can zoom out a bit. Um, I, I'm going to go to weekly and I'm going to okay, turn these sure. lines off because these lines can be disturbing for you. Yeah, um, yeah. So we're at around twenty-seven thousand. Um, we're definitely deep into the bear market um, from the peak. You can see it's been what twenty months or something like that since the peak uh, of November, October, November of twenty twenty. Uh, it's six hundred and eighty-six days. Yes. So well in, and um, yeah, it's 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 pretty boring. <laughs> um, where I think we're at. Um, so the big news would be the spot Bitcoin ETFs that might come in the next three months or the next six months. They've been pushed to January. Um, that mm -hmm. seems to be the big headline for the bull side. For the bear side, we're still, we've got the FTX trial of Sam Bankman Freed. I think that's mm -hmm. in October or November. And then mm -hmm. Binance is still under some decisions and, and suits. So until those clear away, that's kind of an overhang to the negative um okay a bottom side i think 20k is probably a fairly solid support level we could go down um the biggest risk i see is the u.s stocks um i'm quite bullish on mm -hmm. u.s stocks but in in the chance that they turned over in a major sudden recession that would bring us lower in bitcoin and crypto of course not seeing that if that doesn't happen which i don't think it's going to i think we're going to have fairly strong US economy, at least for another six months um, before a recession would hit. And therefore, I think we've got a floor here around 20, 26,000, 25,000, and we're moving up or holding these levels. So can you remind us what's going on with uh, some Bankman fried? Is it uh, also about the assets that are seized from the um, from FTX? Like, can they um, like, uh, can the result of this trial be that lots of crypto assets get dumped on the market i it perhaps i think it's it's equally as important though that um all of that bad headline news gets taken out of the market and that because we've already had major price sell-offs right um so i mean all coins are down what 95 percent on average um bitcoin went down about what 82 83 so i think rather than coins getting dumped it's more likely that once that's resolved and out of the uh, the news and maybe when the Binance lawsuit gets um, resolved and then there'll be more of a sort of a clean a clean future ahead for whatever altcoins survive and, and then Bitcoin as well. So you think that the uh, impact of this trial is rather the headlines? It's headline news, it's overhang and it's not resolved, not right? I mean, okay. it's just going to be bad news. They're going to go, they're going to revise. Okay, what did he do and how bad it was? There's going to be trauma and PTSD and there will be um a lot of a lot of uh you know political up uh, playing up of how bad it was for investors and then we still don't know what the SEC is going to do so we talked about this last year right we talked about the overhang being SEC's 
saying that these are securities, that most of what's traded on Binance and Coinbase are securities. And they seem to be holding that line um, that um, it looks like Ethereum's in the clear, Bitcoin's in the clear, but the other ones are still in this category of being somewhat, they need to be regulated, but there's no regulations yet. So this is all what you'd call overhang to the market, in my opinion. Um, once that clears up next year, 2024, 2025, I think we see the next uh, bull run. All right. So how about me? Um, so I've made the major calls that I'm making. Um, I'm making in my FaceTime videos. So uh, please check them out if you want to hear them. They are fairly efficient. They're short. They are on point always. I will continue making the uh, FaceTime videos and I have made some uh, pretty huge calls there uh, over the past months. So check them out. So today I'm going to talk about rather a short term because um, that's what I didn't talk about in the FaceTime videos. So uh, let's have a look at my favorite okay, indicator that I always bring up. Okay, So this is the overall averaging. This is the open interest slash market cap ratio. It's, uh, it's an excellent stuff, this one. And it's uh, this is not a financial advice, but um, I have a very good experience with uh, monitoring and following this indicator. It actually shows you how much uh, uh, leverage is on the market comparing to the market cap. Okay, if that ratio is too high, then there is going to be some dramatic movement on the market. And it's going to be almost always the crash because there is almost always the, the leverage that is on the market almost always is long. Okay, because We've only rather seen the bull of crypto over the past 10 years. It was just one huge giant bubble, you know, from nothing, from zero to trillion dollars. So we've right. only seen upside so far. Right? Like, like really, like those few years that we had a little bit of the uh, comeback, uh, that was just, uh, you can't really call this on a macro scale, like a, like a real bear. So that's why this almost always the majority of the leverage is long. Very exceptionally, there is a lot of short leverage, but that's not the case today. Right. And um, so we've had quite a lot of long leverage, for instance, at the, uh, in the mid of August. Uh, as you can see, the, this indicator went to 1.87, mm. 1.88. Yeah. And so what happened was the flush of the long leverage. And as you can see, also the indicator went very steeply down. And that's actually very bullish. Uh, Short term, okay. I'm just talking about the short term. I'm talking about, well, you name it, like one, two, three months. However, um, another indicator, great indicator, that the sentiment indicator that I like to watch is that I look at the calls of some other big analysts, okay, like 750,000 subscribers, and like everybody thinks that they're really good. And I just reverse whatever they say. And it's, <laughs> it shows it, it it's, it works exceptionally well. You know, you have no idea. It's very hard to do because you go against the crowd again, because right. essentially what they say is what the crowd thinks. So because they, they are the influencers, they are the, the, the mean, they are the, the, the opinion makers. And there were extensively too many 40K people here. Like it was a 40K, 40K plus 40K. You know, 40k next, 40k next, 40k next. That was the end of. That's what people June. were saying. Yeah. I also made a FaceTime video here, by the way, guys. I made a FaceTime video like uh, like here, in this spot, and you should check it out. I'm not going to tell you what the what the, what the FaceTime video says. Uh, just check it out on my channel. And uh, that's also why I think that what I can tell you that uh, I do think uh, this was the yearly high for Bitcoin. So. Uh, I would say that uh, based on the overall leveraging indicator and um, based on the amount of the uh, leverage comparing to the market cap is not that scary today. It's not that scary. It's 1.56 today. It's not that scary. Also, people are not shorting. So that's that's not good. OK, people are not shorting. You can see there are not really red funding funding fees. This is aggregated funding right here. You know, people were shorting in March, okay? Really shorting in the 12th of March when we were at 20k. That was a really shorting. You know, look what happened. People were really shorting 
there were unbelievable amount of shorts. In November, I remember our podcast with Isabel and Curtis, and everybody was bearish back then. Everybody was saying 10k, 12k maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, <laughs> I disagreed because of this, because of the extensive amount of shorting. It's not happening today. People are not really shorting today. Um, so uh, there is like a mixture. There's always a mixture, good and bad. You know, bullish, bearish. But based on all this, based on everything together, I would say that uh, short term uh, things are not really scary. Things are not scarily bearish just today. Uh, right. I wouldn't say like really, really bullish, but uh, the, the leverage is not there yet. So people are not convinced. People are defensive. People are saying 23 right here. I remember right here. It was also extensive amount of 23 Kers, 23 K, 23 right. next. 23, 22 K next. So uh, again, um, 23 K, I don't think 22 K, I don't think right now it's going to go. I don't think that's the next step. But also this is not, I think this is going to be, this is going to prove to be the yearly high. Could that be. would it's be two months, three months left. Yeah. As far as for my calls, there are my FaceTime videos. And I try not to time them. Also, if there is another thing that I've learned in my years of experience with crypto, never try to time your calls. This is the logarithmic regression. Uh, I'm sure you are very familiar with this. Well, this is the price uh, of Bitcoin in the history, okay, from the inception when it gained first value. Is this was all crypto or just Bitcoin? This is just, this is all crypto. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. This is all crypto. The log regression is still a really, really good uh, um, method how to determine whether we are undervalued and under overvalued and to take some conclusions out of it. And this thing here is the valuation versus this trend line. So the, the higher this goes, the more overvalued we were in terms of price, actual price versus the fair value of the total crypto market cap. Right. And this thing actually looks pretty bullish pretty bullish right it's around it's hovering around uh 40 percent as you can see this is a negative number it's minus 60 okay we were minus 60 here and minus 60 means that we are 40 percent versus the trend line so the yeah. price the the the, the total uh, currency market cap is is 40 percent out of the fair value Okay, uh, maybe we can progress. We spent quite some time about uh, about Bitcoin and the crypto update. Uh, how about the S&P 500? Would you like to sure. Go? This is what I've been using in my some of my videos on YouTube, but it's just a base, a, a very simple look at the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the red line is the 200 week simple moving average, and the green is the 40 week. Um, the reason I include yeah. that is you can see, you can see. Uh, November of 2021, we hit an all-time high of 4,800. Okay, that was yeah. all-time high for the S&P. We then had our uh, Fed raising rates aggressively, and we had a 10-month fall. So it fell down to 3,500. That was about a 26% fall in the S&P. Notice that it touched on the 200-week the moving average there and bounced off that. Mm -hmm. And if you look back, except for COVID, the COVID drop, um, we did not drop below the 200 week moving average until back to 2011 or 2000. Yeah, 2011. Yeah. So we've been above it for 12 years. We're well, well above it again. We bounced. Um, talk about sentiment in October of 2022, about 80% of analysts were bearish. Everyone was saying that a massive recession is coming and that we're okay. going down to 3000. Um, okay. They were they were all wrong. Eighty <laughs> percent of the market was wrong. Um, the the market has rallied since then. We got up to forty six hundred a couple of weeks ago, and we're at forty three hundred. You can see we're solidly in a a bull trend. Um, so going back to why everyone was wrong. So the bearishness was such a, a given. I mean, this relates to what you're saying about being a contrarian versus the crypto influencers, right? And it's, it's kind of obvious if you think about it, if 80% of the market's bearish, it means that all of their clients, all the fund managers, everyone has sold, right? And if everyone yeah. sold, that's the, that's what defines the end of a bear market or a bear yes, trend. They are the influencers. They're making right? the opinions. Yeah. And um, all of, anyone who was nervous and believed that the recession was going to kill us narrative had already sold. So everyone had sold as of October 2022, and then the market went the other way, right? 
Um, that doesn't mean we can't have a recession next year, but you can see we've had a solid trend upwards. Um, and so the question is, how do we end the end of 2023? I'm quite mm -hmm. bullish on it. I think I think there's still, it's very bifurcated now. I think if you go on uh, financial Twitter, in other words, there's e you're either in the bear camp or the bull camp. There's no one in the middle there, I feel. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's because things are quite extreme. Like you do have extremely high mortgage rates. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of leverage. So it's understandable that there's a lot of nervous people. But I, my confidence is that there's still so many bears in the market that I think we're going to go higher. Um, I did a video saying 5,000 by the end of the year. It's not a it's not a solid prediction, but um, it's uh, just I think there's a good chance we rally. Um, fourth quarter is usually good for stocks uh, seasonally, um, especially November, December. Usually you get a rally. Um, and we've held quite well um, at these higher levels. So now, does that affect? Does that pull up Bitcoin and crypto? It might be a reason to bring it up a little bit. Like you said, probably not much higher than around 35,000, but um, uh, stocks rallying would be a good thing for, for crypto in the short term. So this is headline inflation for the last 12 months. It's even steeper if you include 13 months back. So it's been, wow. it's, it's been a while, but we went from 9% to 3%. There's been a little bit of strength lately to 3.2, 3.7. But if you average this out over like a three month windows, if you, you, it's a it's a it's a cliff, it's falling fast. Uh, yesterday, we had the core inflation. So we've got headline inflation, which is all goods. Core inflation takes out oil and food. Core inflation is down to three point nine, which is the first time in 24 months it's been below four percent. Um, I think this is the same one, the same chart, actually, as the other one. OK, then. all right. But the PCE is takes out oil because we've had an oil price go back up. Uh, but um, the Fed doesn't, it, they look at the core because oil can fluctuate very quickly. Mm -hmm. So they prefer that. So basically, long story short, inflation's come down. This is the historical, I can't see the far, oh, there we go. So this is the historical employment rate. We're at about 3.8% um, as of August. You can see we had the COVID spike in 2020. Wow. But, but, Look we're how back fast to the levels, the pre-COVID levels. We're back to pre-COVID levels. Wow. Well, not only pre-COVID levels, but pre-history <laughs> levels. Look at, we're okay. lower than we were all through the 80s. Um, we're as low as we were in, in the 2006, mm -hmm. you know. So um, that's another thing the bears, they they, they haven't, all, I've been just looking at these stats. I've seen inflation going down and jobs holding low. Um and that's the Fed mandate. It's jobs and inflation. So both are kind of coming into line quite well, which suggests they're probably not raising rates um, in the near future. Um, there might be a quarter point in November, but we're basically topping at around five and a half um, percent. Um, what else? Housing. So the big one I was thinking was, well, that a lot of bears were thinking and I was watching is house prices. This is housing prices historically, okay? Um, yes. But more recently, you can see we did have a, a decline in 2022, but we've bounced back, right? Um, in the last six months, prices have started to rise again. And, and again, I think something like 80% of real estate analysts said, for sure, for sure, for sure, we're going to have a housing crash when mortgage rates get up to 7% because... The payments are gonna are gonna balloon. Um, I was thinking if housing started to crash, you would have a negative wealth effect. People would feel poor. Uh, it could cause consumer spending to get lower. Corporate profits fall. People start getting fired. It just hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. The prices are holding, even though sales volume has gone down. People are not selling their houses. Prices are actually going up because there's not enough supply on the market. And there's a reason for that. Basically, most mortgages are fixed mortgages in the U.S., so they don't care about what the current new mortgage rate is because they've locked in very low rates, 2 3% from years before. And also about half, let's say 40% of U.S. houses have zero mortgage. They're owned by baby boomers that paid off their houses a long time ago. Putting this all together, we've got inflation falling, job market is good, housing prices have not crashed. Uh, corporate profits have been fairly good. And that's why, you know, the stock market has rallied. We have not had a recession. This is the U.S. 10-year okay. 
treasury. You've seen mm-hmm. it's it's risen quite a bit recently. It's higher okay. than people thought. Um, and this is scary because the bond market, as we know, bond prices move inverse to the rate. So mm-hmm. bond prices are falling as the rate or existing bonds that people own already start to fall in value as the, the, the yield on new bond issuance rises because those are more attractive. The new issue and issue newly issued bonds are be paying more money than the old ones did, right? So therefore bond funds are getting hurt. And that's why some of these banks went bankrupt in March. If you remember, there was Silicon Valley Bank and a few others. They basically had long duration bonds in their portfolios. And as they and those the value of those started to crash because mm-hmm. rates rose. So they were caught out in some bad trades and they went bankrupt. So there is some concerns that this could happen to more banks, that their their bond holdings uh, lose uh, so much value. The recession still hasn't come. Everyone says there's a lag. The bears will tell you, look, um, it takes time for these higher interest rates to impact the economy. Mm-hmm. And we're going to get a recession <laughs> in the middle of 2024. But mm-hmm. they were saying this about a year and a half ago. So it's a very, very, very delayed recession. So your main point is that um, S&P 500 is due to make um, a new all time high. Yeah, is that right. I, OK, well, we already hit 4600, which was only like 5% off. We That's, hit that three uh, years ago. That so. was pretty, pretty. Um, yeah, it's higher so, than I expected for sure. Yeah, so it's a retest of the high at 46 and then it's it's 4800. Um, people think the S&P is overvalued, right? But we call it the Magnificent Seven. Have you heard this term, David? Magnificent Seven. It's it's basically okay. Facebook, Amazon, uh, Netflix, I don't know if Netflix is in there, Google, Tesla, NVIDIA, the top seven stocks, Microsoft, have rallied like almost 100% each this year. And they've dragged up the S&P PE because of those, those that group of seven. But the other stocks are, are up like 2%, I think, or 1.5%. So it's been a very narrow rally in the S&P. The idea is this would broaden and... Uh, those other 493 stocks out of the 500 will will catch up. We could as well just touch a little bit, perhaps the gold and the US dollar index, DXY, starting with gold. So would you like to comment on that? Yeah, so <laughs> it looks like we're test, we tested three times now. We've tested that $2,000 mm-hmm. mark three times. Um, and then we've fallen off again to uh, 1850 looks like is that right sounds low is gold's about 1900 right now the gold bu- uh, bulls are tortured forever <laughs> um so i think the thing is a little bit with i'm learning this about gold is that as the price rises it gets sold off the miners sell gold that's their job right so mm-hmm. they sell their stocks as the price rises so there's a lot of sell pressure um and there are untapped gold mines that will come online like if the price goes to 2500 or 3000 dollars there's the capacity to increase the supply of gold which will put downward pressure right so i'm not saying gold isn't going higher but you know if you compare it to something like bitcoin which the bitcoiners always talk about fixed supply it is true that you have um with most commodities as the price rises the supply opens up they develop more oil rigs more gold mines more copper mines so it puts sell pressure as the price rises which keeps the price down right um i don't know if that's what's happening with gold but it seems like there's a lot of people that want to sell it at two thousand dollars at least for the last 12 years it looks like it that's been the top so and i follow the japanese yen because i live in japan but the yen is super weak it's even getting weaker um, oh my gosh and it's it's, it's it might have lost its status as what we call a flight to safety currency, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, the reason for that is that Japan is not raising interest rates, but the U.S. is, right? So the U.S. is paying more for U.S. treasuries, and so the bid is to buy U.S. dollars and sell Japanese yen, right? Because you're getting 5% on your U.S. dollars, and you're getting 0% on your yen. So um, that's 
that's partly why we're seeing the DXY rise as well recently. You can jump to that if you want. That's we what can... brings us to the last topic that we wanted to cover. Yeah. The DXY. So the DXY has surprised to the upside the last few, what is that, weeks, right? It's been like 12 mm -hmm. weeks green. Look at that. Look at that green. Yes. Yes. One, two, yes. three, four, five. Since July. 13 weeks of green candles. Now, yes. why? It looks like, so um, the US is the only one raising rates. Um, Canada's raised a little bit, Europe's raised a little bit, but the US dollar is getting a bid as the US rates go higher, or there's a perception they will stay higher. Um, so that's not good generally for crypto, higher, and it's not good for as uh, risk on assets to have a strong US dollar. So uh, hopefully that goes negative a little bit. <laughs> So uh, I would like to comment on this just a little bit. These two lines I've had here for a long time and they worked uh, to my surprise really, really well because also the, the first one, it was, it was broken and then it, was, it acted as support. That's like, it, meant, it means like very bullish. And then I think I even on the podcast, I said that, okay, we are going to go to the second line. And then we went to the second line and then we even went above a little bit on the, uh, the wicks on the weekly candles. And I was always like in my when I was watching this chart, I remember the last year in September, I was like, this can't be above my line. Like the close cannot be on my line. The close cannot be on my line. And to my surprise, it actually really wasn't. It was below my line. All the closes were below my line. And then it went down. And it even right. broke the, the broke the first line. And then again it retested it from the below. So it became a resistance. So these two lines actually I'm very proud of. And now we are testing again this one. So, uh, based on these lines, based on pure technical analysis, we, you said that hopefully uh, there is going to be a little bearishness, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you good news that I think there should be because the this is the moving average, 20 week and the 50 week, and they are going to merge, they're going to intersect soon, and I think the intersection could be retested. So there is going to be some bearishness in the very short term. Right. And what about right. what do you think about the bricks at the very end? Oh, the BRICS. Yeah, I haven't looked into the modern, um, sort of the most recent negotiations on it. Um, yeah, I'm. I again, if you say the U.S. dollar, you've heard me say this before. If someone says the U.S. dollar is going to weaken, I would say against what, mm -hmm. and that would be the only thing. So that would be the BRICS, <laughs> uh, right? But... So if the BRICS, so the Chinese economy, I, it's hard to get, uh, you know, useful data on because a lot of the Chinese government hides their their information, their, their data. But there's a lot of people that believe that China is a big bubble and it's going to crash and will have to devalue their currency. Um, so I guess with BRICS, you would say, can they create a stable currency with all of them together? Because each of those countries there are not really trustworthy. Uh, but yeah, your that, point that's about the biggest GDP, argument against them. Your, yes. your point about GDP, I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking, well, you know, Egypt has 40 million people, but their GDP is not high. But you're right. I mean, China's GDP is obviously very high. India is there as well. That's important. India um, is, uh, think, is bigger economy than France today. Yeah. The question would be, are their currencies stable? Because it would be, I guess, China and mm -hmm. India would be the biggest part of the basket. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and then Brazil, you know. Brazil, Russia, South Africa, Egypt. So one Russia. issue is, can you just trust what's in the basket? Can I have yeah. confidence? And then it, it get, the reason the U.S. dollar has been strong historically is people trust the U.S. Yeah, government. That's the argument and, I've heard. Yeah. And so that would be probably the over under on whether you believe in, in BRICS would be what is more trustworthy. Um, and um, but also if, if they are that strong economically, they could force this on other countries. There could be some sort of political push of, of the currency, but it is a free market. So does the average trader choose the U.S. dollar or a new currency i'm not sure so uh it's time to wrap this up thank you curtis for coming and thank you for sharing with us all your research so once again curtis has his own channel and his own of course he's more active on twitter uh, but he is as well making some uh, youtube videos so check him out um so um thank you again curtis for coming thanks a lot david see you later